Good evening, students. Thank you for coming. Uh, this is the third lecture in the Sociology 455 uh, lecture series uh, for organizational sociology. And uh, what I'd like to cover in this particular le lecture is Max Weber. And I'll return to Max Weber and kind of review a little bit about his concept of rationalization and his iron cage, his myth for the iron cage. Uh, so what I would like to do tonight is start by saying that the iron cage is Weber's actual description of uh, that rationalization. And I know that uh, all of you had social 100, but some of you may not have had it recently or not have, have not taken other, as many sociology classes uh, as others. So let's do a little review of this. Max Weber proposed his rationalization thesis. Let's start with that. Rationalization thesis states uh, that rationalization refers to a historical drive towards a world in which, as Weber said, one can, in principle, master all things by calculation. And he really saw this as kind of uh, a, a way for humans to really stymie their growth. Um, instead of common values and traditions uh, kind of molding us that, and, and socializing us, we kind of fell into this, uh, uh, these traps of bureaucracy, that this, this kind of rationalization where everything becomes numbers, everything becomes rules and regulations and red tape, and it's very, very external, but it's, it's also something that really runs our lives. Uh, and he, he observed that modern capitalism, at his time, modern capitalism is a rational mode of economic life because it depends on a calculable process of production. Okay, so things like monetary accounting, uh, especially double entry bookkeeping, centralized uh, production of control, production control, separation of workers from the means of production, um, influence and control over workers' behavior, and other features that kind of make modern capitalism uh, qualitatively different from other modes of organizing economic life are, were kind of his targets in, in this. He was making a point saying, suddenly the focus is on, not just on commodities, but on numbers, on you know, reducing workers to numbers. So think for a minute about your current position or, or previous job, uh, the, uh, or you as a student, you have a student number, you have an employee number, you have a social security number, you have PIN numbers and passwords, and uh, it's not enough to go by name. You, you are part of a numeric system. Everything is calculable, but it's also assigning kind of numbers to people, kind of uh, objectifying people from, from uh, Max Weber's point of view. Okay? And remember, I mean, he, <laughs> Max Weber uh, you know, died in 1920. So th we're talking about the late 1800s. He was born in 1864 and lived until 1920. You're talking about you know, he, he, what he saw 100 years ago or, or uh, even farther back. So I wonder sometimes what he would say about, uh, about society today and this, this uh, rationalization. Um, but he really kind of predicted it. So for the process of rationalization to happen, in other words, to create calculability and predictability in political, social, and economic structures, in aspects of cultures such as values, uh, then aspects of cultures such as values, ethics, religions, etc., and norms of behavior had to change. So the focus had to be on a much more sub the, the kind of more more subjectivity, making you know, a, a kind of a, a pulling back where uh, there's not one set of of general values, uh, not one set of ethics that is running kind of running the show uh, in terms of our, our society and how we behave, our social behavior. So think back, uh, possibly in your introduction to sociology course, you were introduced to the five primary elements of culture, which are symbols, language, 
uh, values, norms, and then material culture and technology are kind of lumped together in that fifth one. But don't you know, don't uh, gloss over values. Now remember, norms are norms of behavior. That's expectations of behavior. But uh, sometimes people confuse these with values. Values are what we uh, hope to be, what we hope to achieve. Um, it's it's things that are that have often have a lot of uh, they're often viscerally charged. There, there's a lot of emotion behind them. So, uh, you know, like like a sincere belief in equality for all. Have we achieved equality for all? Uh, you know, even on a smaller basis. Not you know, no. But it's something we believe in generally, and it is a considered an American value. It's something for which, which we strive uh, in general. So. But you know, he was pointing out that these value systems are going to be taking more and more of a back seat to this this uh, kind of predictability, this calculability, this rationalization. Okay, so he was saying basically uh, societies have to kind of dump their values and change their norms of behavior in order to uh, uh, fall into the slots created. By rationalization, that this kind of kind of uh, structure and um, institutional rationalization, for instance, requires uh, the emergence and existence of a rational type of personality, which is kind of outlined in the Protestant ethic. Um, so it's and, and please understand, we're not necessarily picking on Protestants or any any religious uh, uh, group in any way. What we're talking about is that cultural ethic where uh, you're never quite done, you're never, you want to focus on work, on working, um, yeah, and, and it's, it, it, the, the, that Protestant ethic, that, that, uh, which is quite, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the nutshell version, uh, but he really kind of, Weber was not a fan of the Protestant ethic, let's just call it that, and when he talks about his iron cage, he really talks about how that Protestant ethic goes, kind of made possible this heavy rationalization. And there are three processes of rationalization. First of all, there's an increasing knowledge, and that's to enable actions to be correlated to results. So if we produce this way, uh, we will, production will increase. Okay. The second uh, process of rationalization is a growing impersonality, impersonal nature, impersonality. And that's an objectification of people. So workers become numbers in an accounting book. The market relationship between buyers and sellers is no longer tethered by relationships. Uh, I'll give you an example. If you have lived in a town where, or maybe your, your parents or your grandparents lived in a town, and they always, or, or in a neighborhood in a larger city, and uh, you know it's possible that they really knew just about everybody in their immediate area, and uh, maybe they always went to the same butcher that was to the left of the street, not on the right of the street, um, because you know when you're regular customers, you create a relationship with that butcher. There was there was a, a time when people really had to create a social relationship to make. The economy move to so you know you have your your favorite butcher you always go to them believe me they'll hear about it if you go to the other butcher and you know they save you the better cups of cuts of meat because you're a regular customer because you have a social connection now we practice more of a market mentality where uh, you get as much as you can for giving as little as possible and it doesn't mean that people are worse or better we're not talking about it. we're saying the system is different okay. Uh, so there's that growing impersonality that's an objectification of people where workers just become numbers in an accounting book. Um, the connection between uh, bosses and staff is, is um, you know, it, it, in some cases, all but severed. There's uh, that disconnect between the tiers in a hierarchy. And the third uh, process of rationalization is that enhanced control in social life and material life via science and technology. So um, think about, you know, the, 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 I've said it many times, computers are great until they don't work. And suddenly I can't do my job. I can't do 
the same things, I, you know, the things I need to do. I can't do the same things anymore. Um, if I forget my PIN number, if, you know, I have to have a social security number just to get a bank account. I have to get a, a, you know, get my social security number out to so many different people, uh, so many different organizations. And, you know, a lot of that has to do with me being a number according to the U.S. government. And we always hear about somebody with the same name, you know, sometimes being declared dead. You hear about that that once in a, you know, a blue moon thing where somebody's declared dead and like, no, I'm alive, but they cut off their social security because maybe Mary Brown in another uh, town uh, passed away or Joe Smith from another town passed away and, and uh, they, you know, canceled the social security or social security of, uh, of this, of the wrong person. But, for the most part, we are at least partially classified, if not to a great extent classified, by the numbers in our life. We are kind of uh, check marks, okay? Because it, you know, with the United States population, how do you keep track of 320 million people in a country this large? You know, how do you do that? One of the ways you do that is you know, you you create this massive bureaucracy. So it's, you don't just trust the little communities to kind of sustain themselves. It's it's a huge, massive uh, mega society. So to say. Okay. So what is the iron cage? These are the effects of rationalization. Okay. So th there are two effects that I wanted to to address that are predicted by Max Weber. So first of all, Weber thought the future of rationalization would be sort of a mechanized petrification and chaos, an inundation of subjective values. And, you know, I, I can only imagine what he would have thought of uh, social media, uh, where you have this inundation of many, many subjective values to the point now where uh, I can honestly say for the first 15, 20 years I was teaching, I did not have to explain to too many people the difference between um, uh, subjectivity and objectivity in uh, perspectives. People, you know, started very early understanding the difference between uh, fact and uh, subjective reality opinion. Now, since social media has become such a huge part of our lives, it doesn't mean my students are any less smart. It means that they are part of a culture that is teaching us that those lines are heavily blurred. We can basically get all of our news, not from news sources, but from uh, you know blogs and opinion pages and treat it like news, treat it like um, objective reporting. And it gets to the point where you know people are really having to, to kind of wade through a lot of, of opinion, and a lot of subjectivity to find that kernel of truth, to find those facts, and to find, and we even have, uh, you know, television news stations that will kind of tell you the stories you want to hear. And there was always something of that. Uh, not saying that they were necessarily artificially created stories, but saying that they are, you know, what, what stories are you going to present? Which ones are you not going to present? Uh, you know, can, can kind of reflect uh, the political leaning. Of whoever's pulling the strings at the top, so, or you know, what what is the audience really? So, never thought the future with, of rationalization would be a sort of mechanized petrification and chaos, and that inundation of subjective values. Uh, secondly, he thought another effect of rationalization would be this value fragmentation. So, never thought we are living, and and this is direct quote as did the ancients, when their world was not yet disenchanted of its gods and demons. What he was saying is we swallow the values our leaders feed us. Now, p different people have different uh, leaders <laughs> to some extent. We have, we have leaders, but who do we choose as our leader, as, as the person we want to actually follow? So think about during the past, uh, you know, really it's in, it's since the new millennium, millennium started, um, how often have we heard that opinion television or political speeches are taken as truth? How many voters, even occasionally journalists, seem to consider fact-checking unnecessary? 
I'm not sure I'd call those people journalists, but uh, voters who take leaders' words as gospel truth instead of verifying them, fact-checking, especially your own, uh, you know, political leaders, um, and, and and dismiss everybody, every other uh, maybe political party's views. Um, these this is uh, th these people, uh, all of us are in a sense the objectified worker. We tow the party line, whether that's a political party or uh, some other in-group to which we belong, uh, we stop hearing the alternative perspectives and we seek out, because there's so much of it, whatever agree we agree with. So, it, it, and this is hard, and I'm, I'm not saying that I or anyone else is, is separate from this, because this is our modern socialization. We don't stop being socialized when we turn 18. We continue to have those effects of socialization. Anytime you walk into an environment that is slightly new to you, you are learning and you're much more aware that you are you are uh, being socialized into a new experience. You know, we all need those challenges. So, you know, this is something that, that Max Weber actually, he warned us, yeah, a hundred, more than a hundred years ago. And so he was saying, look, this can, this can be the result of this heavy, this, this, this kind of, uh, this, this massive centralized control, of uh, this huge rationalization of people. As he saw also governments getting larger and larger and capitalism where, where we're focused much more on commodities. And there were a lot of sociologists who, who you know, groused about the focus on, on gathering material goods. And, you know, um, yeah, I, I would say that, that we'd be hard pressed to say that they were all, you know, interested in casting off all, uh, you know, material goods and going out there. There were only a couple who were really, you know, go, go in that direction. But they were concerned about the focus changing from relationships to one of um, material connection, basically commodities. Okay, so uh, yeah. It, it, you know, this value fragmentation has possibly helped spawn a really strange phenomenon, which is a mistrust and suspicion of formal scientific education and the educated. So <laughs> you will find uh, in, in different parts of, of the United States that kind of suspicion. And it doesn't necessarily go down party lines. Don't, don't be uh, you know, guilty of what so many of us are by that, by by virtue of this very uh, phenomenon, which is what we call pitchfork values, where we throw it over our shoulder and say, "Yep, that person over there is guilty of that." Remember, we are all products of society. We are also we are very we are very much a social creature. Okay, so we are the products of our society, which makes you know sociology so challenging because we are also the subject of our own study. Okay. So, if you have any questions or would like to talk about this a little bit more, please go to your uh, go to the virtual office and post questions uh, to your professor and uh, continue the conversation. Thank you for attending and have a very nice day.